Targovishta, Easter, 1457. The Wallachian boyars are feasting at Vlad Dracula's table. In their fine Easter clothes, they raise cups to their new prince. The past, they say, is forgotten. <laughs> but Vlad does not forget. Suddenly, there's a commotion, and soldiers begin grabbing their arms. Vlad then separates the boyars and their families who had risen against his father and buried his brother alive, marching them out into the spring cold. The oldest are immediately impaled, while the others are force marched down to a town below a ruined mountain fortress and told to pick up the freshly made bricks there. They will carry the bricks up the mountain, rebuilding Vlad's new castle for the rest of their short lives, their fine clothes tearing and falling away until they're nearly naked, and most work until they collapse and die. Ah, but who cares if the boyars perish from frostbite and exhaustion, eh? Vlad is the prince, and he can appoint new nobles. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for helping bring history to the table. Now, if you watched our last two episodes and thought, huh, I thought this guy was called Vlad the Impaler, but he's hardly impaled anyone. Bring on the impaling! After this episode, you might regret that ask, because this part of the tale contains like a bajillion percent more impalings and violence. Seriously, it's a lot. So please let this serve as a content warning for everything that follows, because this one's going to get brutal. But before we go there, I want to take a slight detour and talk about state violence during this era, since it's important to understanding Vlad, his times, and how he's remembered. The 15th century was a particularly bloody time in Europe, one where violence was commonplace in everyday life. Few laws governed warfare, and rebellions often ended with massacres or mass executions. And it was common all over Europe to keep populations in line with displays of extreme violence, as this was an era of gory public executions and torture. English kings put heads on spikes, French ones broke people on the wheel, and the Spanish had the Inquisition. In other words, public displays of cruelty were a form of political communication. We say this not to excuse Vlad. Actually, if anything, it does the opposite. Because even by these standards, his campaigns of violence were considered extreme. While we don't have a lot of primary source documents on Vlad, and things written about him or preserved orally are likely exaggerated, there is a clear theme that emerges when we look at his second reign. When he gained the throne in 1457, Vlad embarked on a planned, deliberate campaign to break the power of the boyars, which had been on the rise since the time of his grandfather. In fact, the instability of the Wallachian throne was not all due to outside interventions by Hungary and the Ottomans. It had as much, if not more, to do with the Wallachian boyars, who always tried to steer the weakest candidate to the throne and increase the power of their own council. Vlad, on the other hand, tended toward the aristocratic, centralized version of power that was on the rise in the Renaissance. In Vlad's mind, it would be he who controlled Wallachia, not the boyars, and not the church. And the only way to keep the throne would be to become as powerful as possible. You can judge for yourselves, he explained in a letter to the Transylvanian town of Brashov. When a man or prince is strong and powerful, he can make peace as he wants to. But when he is weak, a strong man will come and do what he wants to him. His first act was to purge the boyars of any deemed unfaithful or ambitious, frequently executing them via impalement. Between 1457 and 1461, he replaced all but two boyars in his royal council, a body that rarely changed, even as the prince did, suggesting he likely surrounded himself with loyalists. Those loyalists came from a lower strata of the boyar class, while others were mercenaries or followers from his exile in Transylvania, basically people that owed their elevation directly to Vlad and who often had no previous ties or allegiances in Wallachia. And the wealth and land that Vlad gave them had, conveniently enough, been provided by their predecessors, who didn't need it anymore. He also instituted a campaign of terror in order to enforce public order. Now, we have to be cautious when discussing this, since first-hand records about his domestic massacres are lacking, and those written by outsiders, based on reports within the country, likely include some exaggeration. But even Romanian oral traditions that are kind to Vlad, casting him as tough but fair, still emphasize his extreme cruelty. Thieves were beheaded, unfaithful wives skinned alive, lazy peasants impaled, Roma people forced into the military or boiled alive. A Romanian folktale tells of how he threw a banquet for beggars, then locked the doors and burned the hall down to stop them burdening the state. And several accounts discuss him impaling priests who did not show him suitable respect. 
In another story, two diplomats, in some versions representatives of the Ottomans, in others Genoese Italians, once said it was against their custom to remove either their turbans or skullcaps before Vlad. So, he supposedly honored this tradition by having their head coverings nailed to their skulls. And while we can't verify the truth of all these stories, they all share common elements. They portray a ruler who is trying to assert not only his own authority, but who wants to enforce a strict moral code, emphasizing hard work and deference to authority. They also suggest a tendency towards sadism. But the massacres reached a new height when it came to the Transylvanian town of Brajov, which he had wrote to early in his reign, promising his protection if they agreed he could retreat there in the event of being dethroned. The relations between Vlad and Brajov got rocky fast. See, Brajov was the center of German-Saxon settlement in Transylvania, and a major location for trade and manufacturing. And while it happily sent Vlad artisans, it was also under pressure from Hungary, who by this point realized Vlad was not going to be a Hungarian vassal, to throw their support behind one of Vlad's relatives instead. Two of which, you know, just happened to be hanging around Saxon Transylvania, waiting for their moment. Including Vlad's half-brother, Vlad the Monk. Because again, this series needed more guys named Vlad. Vlad kept up the dance of diplomacy with the Transylvanian Saxons for a couple of years, ordering them to expel the pretenders and occasionally carrying out reprisals to make it happen. But by 1459, when these Saxons recognized a third pretender, his patience ran out. He rounded up 41 Brashov merchants living in Wallachia and impaled them. Then he had 300 other Saxons burned alive, claiming that some were spies. Then he led a two-pronged attack into southern Transylvania, burning towns and attacking the outskirts of Brajov before withdrawing. This attack killed thousands and remains one of Vlad's most infamous acts. In retaliation, the Saxons of Brajov threw their full support behind another one of Vlad's relatives, Dan the Pretender, to make a try for the throne. And just from the fact that history remembers this guy as the pretender, you could probably guess that that did not go well. Captured after a brief battle, Dan supposedly knelt while his grave was dug in front of him, all the while a priest conducting a burial service while the terrified man was still alive, all of which climaxed when an executioner's axe fell, dropping the pretender's head into an open pit. Three years into his second reign, Vlad had, through utter brutality, achieved many of his goals. He terrorized the boyars into submission or replaced them, strengthened his power, and created a spectacle of gore so incredible that both pretenders to the throne and foreign enemies along the border would think twice about trying to unseat the son of the dragon. And so he turned to foreign policy, the Ottomans. Though Vlad started his reign by paying Mehmed financial tribute, that first payment was the only one he'd sent. And by 1461, he was three years past due, and Mehmed was looking for a meeting to clear up the diplomatic frostiness. The envoys of Mehmed came in force, a Greek diplomat and a Turkish commander at their head. They had planned to capture Vlad, much like Murad had captured Vlad's father. Instead, Vlad's army came out of hiding, surrounding the Turkish force. And upon marching them back to Targovishta, the Ottoman envoys beheld a stake erected for each of them, with two higher than the others, one for the Greek diplomat and one for the Turkish commander. Within weeks, Vlad's army was across the Danube River, ravaging Turkish territory, impaling thousands of prisoners and burning civilians in their homes. Vlad was going to war against the Ottoman Empire, a clash that would prove a reunion. For leading the Turkish army against him was his childhood companion Mehmed, and at the Sultan's right hand, someone even closer to home, Vlad's own brother, Radu the Handsome. Oh boy. But whether you're an Ottoman emperor, a Wallachian ruler, or simply a handsome sibling, one thing's for sure, everyone's gotta eat, and no one helps you with a home-cooked meal better than HelloFresh. You know, I truly love that HelloFresh sponsors our channel because they've been saving me time and keeping me way less hangry for ages now, while also eliminating trips to the grocery store and stressful meal planning. I get everything I need to prepare delicious meals all delivered to my door, and I'm eating in like a half hour or less. Ooh, and this week, I made one of my Hall of Fame faves, chicken sausage spaghetti bolognese for two. <laughs> oh yeah, and it was tasty while Jeff whipped up a family-sized serving of Mamma Mia mozzarella meat lovers. Because, you know, Zoe has really turned me around on this whole second dinner thing. You said it, bud. 
tastiness aside, another great thing about HelloFresh is the work that they've done on the sustainability front. Ingredients are pre-portioned, which means less food waste, and the carbon footprint of their service is actually 25% smaller than that of meals made from store-bought groceries. And there hasn't been a better time to try out HelloFresh for yourself. Thanks to this delectable deal, all you gotta do is go to HelloFresh.com and use the code EXTRACREDITS14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. Oh, no, you heard me right. You can get free food while supporting the content you love, the environment, and most importantly, your tummy. Again, that's 14 free meals at HelloFresh.com using the code EXTRACREDITS14. Your time and taste buds will thank you, and so will we. Thanks. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.